Hey everybody, James with Love My Pups. A Q&A session, kind of catch up on some of the Q&A questions we've had asked in this last week or so. Um, all right, so somebody's asking about AKC colors. So, um, and, they, and they say made the statement, um, murals have not been accepted with the AKC since 2013. Well, I don't think that's quite right. So what's going on here is, is uh, on an AKC application for a puppy, there's a block down the bottom and you put a code in for the color of the dog. So you can now, I'm talking French here, but now this can be true of other, other colors, other breeds as well. But what happens is, is that you, you have a dog that the color is not specified down there on the code numbers. So what do you do? So the, 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 this person's under the impression that since Merle, which has never been on the AKC Frenchie form, is not there, you can't register the dog. No, nope, not true. You can absolutely register that dog. You just can't register as a Merle. So what's going on here? Well, the answer is, is that AKC is really all about the show ring. And there are only certain colors for Frenchies that are allowed in the show ring. And those would be brindles. Fawns, creams, uh, and then you can have variations of this. They could be pied. You could have a pied fawn, a brindle, a brindle pied. Um, but those are the three basic colours that are that are colours that could be judged in the show ring. If you've got blue, chocolate, um, something with tan points. Uh, Merles, Fluffies, um, and other colours that I can't even think about right now, they are all not on the form. They are not on the form. So I'm going to put those in red because those are disqualifications. If you show those in the show ring, you're going to get thrown out of the show ring. You might win a, a round or two, but at some point someone's going to claim and say, hey, you can't have a blue, blue dog in the show ring. And they're right. These are not show colors. It doesn't mean they're not Frenchies, and it doesn't mean you can't register them because you can. You just will not find those particular um, names on the AKC form. So what do you do? Well, you just register them as a cream, a fawn, or a brindle, whichever you think is the closer to what you got. It used to be that you, I think you still can, you can send in a picture of your dog and they'll accept blue or they, they might call it gray and they'll put that on your AKC paperwork and they'll have gray on there. But honestly, um, this is not a relevant thing to me at all because here's the deal. Your dog is an AKC dog. It has AKC parents. So it is AKC registrable. You have to register a dog AKC both parents have to be verified with AKC numbers. Then after that, if it's one of these colors here, look, you're not showing at the show ring, but it's still registrable as an AKC dog. It just won't be registrable as those colors. And it doesn't matter, because if you put the color down wrong, who cares? It's not gonna go in the show ring. I hope that explains that well enough. Okay, I get quite a few questions about that. So that was that one. <clears throat> okay. Um, Somebody asked, why do you not like Brindle? I've done a whole a thing on Brindles. Now, Brindle is absolutely a, probably the most common color that you see in the show ring. Nothing wrong with Brindle dogs. It's not that I don't like Brindles. I do like Brindles, especially like reverse Brindles. I think they're very attractive, but uh, they mess up tan points. If you, if you want to try to produce tan points, then you will get that completely wiped out by the presence of Brindle. And the problem with Brindle is it's a dominant gene, so it's hard to get rid of it. So I typically do not want to see Brindle in my dogs. Uh, now I breed to other people's dogs that have Brindle. That's another question that we'll, we'll, we'll face at the same time. So what's going on with this? If you look at a hair of a dog, <clears throat> then when it's Brindle, it has banding <clears throat> all the way along the hair. And it gives this kind of stripy appearance. If you've got tan points, then that dog just has no color on the tip. So this part doesn't have 10 points. And when you put the two together, this just gets messed up is basically the answer to it. So basically, if you have a dog that's brindled with 10 points on its legs where it just have 10 points, you'll see some muddling up. That brindling will show up in there and mess up the 10 points. So 
that's really the primary reason that tan points kind of mucks things up. Um, somebody's asked also about uh, brindle, is it it's dominant? What happens if you breed a brindle dog to a non-brindle dog? So we'll go back to Punnett Square and show how that works out. So we've got, uh, the, this is the dad, not that it matters which side is which, this is the mum. And remember the Punnett Square we divided into four. Each parent has two copies of each gene that we're talking about. We're talking about the brindle gene. So we're going to call this KB, that it has, the mum has one copy of brindle, and then we're going to just call this KY, she does not have brindle. And dad does not have brindle. So we look at the Punnett square, what do we get? Well, we get a KY, KB here. And we do the same thing here, we get a KY, KB here. And we get a KY, KY. A K Y K Y. So half the litter is not brindle, and half the litter has brindle. And remember, it just takes one copy of brindle for it to show up. So there you go. So there's the answer. If you breed a non-brindle dog to a brindle dog, you can expect half the litter to show brindle. Now, there's two examples where that will not happen, and that's if you have a cream dog. If you produce cream puppies, cream wipes out all the other colors, and so it masks the brindle. So one way if you don't want brindle dogs is you either don't breed to a brindle dog, or if you've got cream dogs, you breed to another cream dog, get all creams, the brindle's gone. Uh, somebody asked about my thing on co-owning. They asked, um, I, talk, talk, I mentioned that I do a split, that I get the proceeds from two puppies, and the uh, co-owner gets the proceed from one puppy. So that's it, three puppies, right? Three puppies, they're going to get one third, I get two thirds. So I get two thirds of proceeds, they get one third, and that equals one. Well, what happens if you have like two puppies? How do you split a puppy up? Three ways to get two puppies. Well, it's simple. You're not actually splitting the puppies up. You're selling the puppies and splitting the money. So example would be if you had a single dog, you had one dog and it sold for $6,000. You wouldn't take that one dog and split it up into two thirds and I get one third, the puppy would live through that. But what you do is you sell a puppy and then I would get $4,000 and my co-owner would get $2,000. So hopefully that clarifies that part. So it doesn't have to be physically the puppy you're splitting up, it can be the proceeds of selling the puppies that you're doing. Um, and another example of that would be, let's say you had a litter of uh, nine puppies. And uh, um, it's a, it's a um, one, two split. I get two puppies, the other person gets one. They decide, so we've got nine puppies. So basically I'm gonna get six puppies, or the proceeds of six puppies, and they're gonna get the proceeds of three puppies. That's how that's gonna split up, right? Well now let's say they want a puppy. Well they can physically have a puppy. So we'll just give them a puppy, so they get a puppy, and they get the sales from two others. So you've, there are all ways you can be creative about this and make it work out so it's fair. So they don't have to just be money, it could be actually physically you split the puppies up. Okay. Uh, what age do you tape up rear legs? Rear legs. Well, the moment that a puppy is a couple of weeks old and it's swimming around, maybe a week and a half, two weeks old, and it's swimming around and its back legs are splayed out, it's not getting up on its feet, that's time to tape up its back legs. And you keep its tape, back legs taped up until it fixes the problem. And you don't have to take the tape off because I promise you, the other puppies and mum in the litter will do that for you. So you will have, you know, every day you'll be putting tape on the legs because um, it's not staying on there. So you'll know when you've got it fixed. So how long does it take? Typically... Now, it might just be a couple of days to get it sorted out, but one that's a really big fat puppy with Scott, you know, always developed a flat chest because it's been on its legs, for, on its belly for so long, it might take you a week or two. Uh, when do you count the first day of heat? Well, so the signs of a dog that's coming to heat will typically be maybe behavioral changes, swelling of the vulva, but none of that counts until you see first drops of blood. First drops of blood on the bedding, if you've got panties on them in their panties, or on the floor, see some drops of blood, that's day one. Shipping incubators overseas, can you do it? Absolutely, we ship incubators overseas all the time, and our incubators will run on both 110 and 240 volts. So, and we give you the appropriate adapter to match the plugs that you have in the country you're using it. 
Uh, signs of heat. Uh, signs of heat. Oh, somebody's asking here. There's a couple of questions on this. Uh, what are the signs uh, that a dog um, that a dog has been bred successfully? Um, well, the first things that you typically see are maybe morning sickness. So that might be the first thing you see. So you might see a dog that starts throwing up. Uh, you might see some being lazy, a dog that wants to sleep a lot. These can happen in the first few weeks sometimes. Uh, the next one would be that its nipples start to enlarge. And this is a lot more obvious on a puppy that's a dog that's never been bred before because puppies that haven't been bred before have got very small little nipples. After they've had puppies, their nipples tend to stay bigger, but you can see some nipple enlargement. Um, now you can see some vomiting, which is part of this morning sickness, vomiting, that's part of the morning sickness. Then of course, then the other obvious signs, like they're getting fat, you know, bigger belly, you know, those are obvious things. And then you can go have a relaxing hormone test done in about 24 days. An ultrasound done in about 30 days if you want to find out whether the dog's pregnant. Um, so something else that said another question somebody asked was about pseudo pregnancies. You can get all of these signs with a dog that's not pregnant. That can be very confusing. All of that stuff can happen in what's called a pseudo pregnancy. A pseudo, uh, how do you spell pseudo? Pseudo, not like that. Uh, let's spell it like this. Pseudo, uh, that's probably not it either. There's an S in there somewhere, so yeah, doesn't matter. Anyway, pseudo pregnancy, someone will correct me on how to spell it. That's not the right spelling of pseudo. But a pseudo pregnancy, all of these signs that uh, can, uh, that's probably pseudo, all of these signs can show up regardless whether the dog's actually pregnant or not. Of course, the thing that really convinces you that a dog's pregnant is an ultrasound or a relaxing hormone test to show the dog really is pregnant. You can even have a dog has milk and goes into labor with the subo pregnancy has contractions so but again that's pretty this pretty that doesn't hardly ever happen but certainly a pseudo pregnancy where you've got some outward signs you think the dog is pregnant that does happen and sometimes the dog did get pregnant but it just reabsorbed the puppies and so you think the dog's pregnant and in fact it is but nothing ever happens two two months later because the puppies got reabsorbed why do we do c-sections over natural births because French Bulldogs have big heads and small hips, and if you elect to have a natural, a natural whelp, you would very, very likely run into problems and lose puppies uh, or possibly even the mother. And so the secret to this is if you decide that this is a course you want to go down, which I highly don't recommend that you do, is that you have an x-ray done at about five days out so that you can look at the x-ray and determine, number one, how many puppies there are, so you know when the last puppy has been delivered and the last placenta has been delivered, because you don't want to leave puppies inside a mum. And the second thing is, is to check and see whether or not their heads are big. Do you have lots of small puppies? If you've got a big 30 pound dog and she's got full of eight small puppies, then that might be a go. But if you've got a 20 pound dog with one huge puppy in it, it is not happening. Uh, Brindle versus Trindle, is Trindle dominant too? Well, you're talking about different things here. So, I don't like the words, so people talk about tri-carriers. I've got a tri-carrier dog. Um, you know, it's a triple carrier, it's a tri. To me, I think that it makes much more sense to say exactly what the dog's carrying because it can be, it can be confusing as to what tri means. But a tri carrier, carrier dog would, would typically be a dog that carries blue. It's not blue, but it carries blue. It's not chocolate, but it carries chocolate. It doesn't have tan points, but it carries tan points. That would be an example of a tri carrier. It, tri, it carries three tri three things that are not shown but are physically there in the dog. And if you put, Brind if it is a Brindle dog, or it has even a single copy of Brindle, then that then becomes a Trindle. So that's a Trindle. And Trindle is a dog that has three other colors and it's Brindle, that's a Trindle. And so all that means is, and, and again, these are all recessive characters. You have to have another copy uh, the, for puppies to show it. Brindle is not, so Brindle is a, is a dominant gene. So Brindle is just another way of saying, I have a dog that is a tri-carrier that's Brindle, called a Trindle. But I don't like the expression tri because I think it's very confusing in terms of what the dog actually, actually, I like to say if a, if a dog, now if I've got a fawn dog that carries blue, carries chocolate, carries 10 points, then I call it that way, I don't call it a tri. 
Uh, my dog has been producing blood when he ejaculates. What are the causes? What can I do? So there's two, the, for me, that I see this, there's two reasons this can happen. Uh, I do see this fairly frequently in a dog that has not been used in a while, where the semen that you collect has kind of a pinky color to it, or you might collect fine, and then at the end of it, you might see a little bit of blood, end up a drop of blood in there. Doesn't take very much blood before the thing looks pretty red. Those collections are okay, they still end up with pregnant dogs. So this fix for that one is just to collect from a dog more often, and that typically goes away. Now you could have some kind of a, um, an infection in the dog, uh, and that would then be, it's time to have a trip to the vet to go get some antibiotics, because there could be physically infection going on that's causing irritation somewhere up in his urinary tract, for instance, or, or maybe even in the scrotum. And, and again, that would take a trip to the vet, who would then look at the semen, uh, semen, or at least look at some urine and decide whether there was a bacterial infection, treat it accordingly. Then the other one is, is that you can get a dog has a sheath, has a sheath over the penis, there's a sheath over it, and when he gets an erection, that sheath goes back and the tip of the penis, or quite a bit of the penis, or maybe the entire penis is showing. He can get some trauma around this sheath that can make that bleed. And so you can get a bit of blood from that sheath that then goes into your collection cup. So that's a rather different thing. And that's completely irrelevant. That just doesn't matter at all. Other than you want your, you know, you probably should put some Neosporin or something on the area that you can see has got a tear in it so that it doesn't cause him discomfort. And the last thing about that is I do have a, I have one dog called Sterling, who's a great dog. He's been a, a great producer for many, many years, but he has a very tight sheath. And so he will end up getting his penis stuck on the outside. And if I come back 10 minutes later, he won't be erect anymore, but this thing is, is, there's a big old bulb on the end of it where he couldn't get his penis back inside. And so what I do is just put a bit of Vaseline on his tip of his penis and massage it a little bit and the whole thing goes back. You don't want to leave a dog, when you've, when you've bred a dog, you absolutely want to go back and check that dog and make sure that he's retracted properly. Because if he hasn't, he can and very likely will damage the, the head of his penis. Someone's asking about breeding a reverse brindle to reverse brindle. Is they ask, if I read a reverse brindle to reverse brindle, will I get a reverse brindle? I don't know. I don't breed brindles hardly, so I just don't have a lot of experience with this. I suspect the answer is that you'll probably get some reverse brindles in there, but reverse brindles, you don't see them that often. So I really don't know. Maybe somebody else can answer that question. I don't know specifically whether you can look at, you know, I, I just don't know how the other than looking at a dog, you, you couldn't look at its DNA and tell it's a reverse brindle. So I just, I, I suspect that it's kind of a hit and miss thing. Um, why did I write that down? Someone's asking about splitting semen. Um, so what they've got is the specific question on this is they had two dogs and they want to breed them both at the same time. So they're going to split the semen between two dogs. And is this okay? Well, maybe. So if you've got a dog that's got large testicles, he's a few years old, he, he gets used a lot, he produces a lot, and he hasn't been used in a week or two, then quite likely you could split that because you, you typically would want to see 200 million <clears throat> motile semen is considered a, an adequate ejaculate. And you only need about half of that to get a full-size litter. So absolutely, you could split that. Though this is not what I would do. So, so I'm going to go through two scenarios. One is you've got two dogs that you want to breed. What I would do is I, I would say, um, this is day one. This is day, day three. What I would do is I would breed this first dog, dog number one, I'd breed that dog in the morning. Then dog number two, I'd breed that night. Then I would wait a day, I'd miss out day two completely, and I would then breed, uh, I'd breed this day one in the morning again. Actually, I'd do it the other way around. I'd breed do day two in the morning, and I'd breed day one in the evening. So you've got some recharge time. You know, you won't get as good a pull the same day. This pull will probably not be as good as this one. And that's why, that's why I, I swap them around. So day one gets the first guy, and day one gets the last guy. Excuse me, puppy, dog one gets the last, the last go, the first go, the last go, and this dog gets the second go and the, and the, and the, the, set, the first go after the two-day break. I hope I explained that properly. 
what I'm saying here is, is that rather than splitting the load, I pulled from a dog twice. So you're pulling from a dog four times in basically a three day period. And most dogs, that will work. If he has been used recently before that, within a few days, that probably will not work. If I am shipping to somebody and they want to split the load, I always recommend to them that we don't do that, that we, we do this, we, we ship out today, day one, and the AI, we wait a day, and we ship out again on day three. That's what I recommend. That's enough recharge time that the dog will do great on both those collections. So if you're gonna do a breeding, um, and I would not split the load unless you need to, so my recommendation would be to pull from the dog twice, not split. Uh, timing, watch for all signs. Okay, somebody was asking about that they, um, I've got so much stuff on this, I'm not spending a lot of time on this, but basically this goes back to this progesterone level thing. <clears throat> that this is day one of heat. Well, no, let's just do this. This is, this is the day that you AI, and we expect it to be 61 days to when whelp occurs. And we're trying to time the C-section. This is progesterone level here. And when we AI, the progesterone level should have been about 15, then it rises up very rapidly, it stays high, and then it does a precipitous drop just a few days from whelp, and it comes down to a level of two or something. Um, so, so the question was, if you didn't get the AI right, how do you know when to get the timing right at this end here? Well, it doesn't really matter whether you got the AI right or not. You still got to do go through all the due diligence to make sure you're getting this right. So what you look for is a temperature drop below 99 degrees, so 98.9 or less. That's indicative of puppies within 24 hours. Uh, and by the way, I'm going to tell you a story about a lady that uh, had some puppies the other day and she called me up and it was actually the vet. That was actually yesterday, Monday. Well, it was Monday or Tuesday. And the vet said, let's schedule a C-section for Friday. And she called me up and I said, oh, I've got the due date as being Thursday. And I think that you need to be watching things before that. And she'd be taking the dog's temperature. She was not seeing the temperature change. The dog was eating food, but not eating food is another clear sign that probably, well, not a clear sign, but a sign that you are 24 hours out from having puppies. And then nesting, it typically means that you're 12 hours out. And then heavy continuous panting typically means you're six hours or less. So she hadn't seen any of these signs, but she called me up. She said uh, she's panting a little bit, but she had a bit of a discharge and there's some color in it. Uh, and it was actually day 59. It was still a couple of days from when we thought the due date was. And I said to her, I don't know, that discharge the way that it is, it sounds to me like she's getting pretty close and she's not going to show these signs and she didn't. And I said, you need to keep a careful eye on that dog. What I would recommend is you go to the vet this morning, get a progesterone test done and see if you have a progesterone level of less than two. Because if it's less than two, you're safe to take puppies. So she said, yeah, I'll have that done. She called me back up half an hour later. She said she had a big discharge, lots of water came out. It's like, go to the vet. So that dog on day 59 broke water and it was ready to have puppies. And so she had a really beautiful litter of puppies. It all worked out well. But, you know, the vet said come in Friday. And this was like three days before that. And it was still fine because what happened was is we probably bred that dog a little bit late. And because of that, it looked like that we had a longer time to go to work when we didn't. Okay, well, I think that's it. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, if you like all this stuff, give me a thumbs up, subscribe. If you think we need to change some stuff or, or, or answer different questions for you, let us know. And of course, always be nice to your doggies. Bye, everybody.